Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Brookings. My name is Dhruva Jayashankar. I'm fellow of foreign policy at Brookings India. Uh, many of you may know this already, but uh, Brookings India is one of the three overseas centers of the Brookings Institution. Uh, it was founded five years ago and now includes uh, a staff of about 25 people working in three broad areas in uh, economic development, in energy, and on foreign policy. Um, and it's a real privilege to be here in Washington uh, with my colleagues at Brookings and Brookings India, who I'll introduce in a minute, uh, to discuss India's uh, role in, uh, in, in a changing world. Uh, why are we talking about India? Well, India is the, uh, some of you may know, India surpassed <coughs> France this year to be the world's sixth largest economy. It will either <coughs> this year or next year become the world's fifth largest economy. Um, it, is, uh, it has the largest standing military of any country. It's a nuclear power. It has a blue water navy. Uh, and it's playing a growing role also in the Indian Ocean region, in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, amongst other places. Uh, India is also incre increasingly globally integrated. Uh, it is, uh, the, by some measures, the world's largest arms importer. It is, has the second largest number of internet users. It is the third largest energy importer. And it's, there's also the people-to-people -people exchanges are also increasing, not just with the United States, but with many other parts of the world. Uh, it has the world's largest diaspora. It has the second largest number of overseas students. And so we have an India that is, that's changing, that's playing a more active role in many ways on, on the global stage. But equally, India has a fair number of challenges. It, is, it may be an increasingly rich country. Um, a new book uh, out by a former uh, international journalist, James Crabtree, uh, called The Billionaire Raj, highlights how India has the fourth largest number of billionaires of any country in the world. But it also has the world's largest number of poor people. And um, in, in some ways, that, that uh, highlights the dichotomy that, 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 and the paradox that is India. Uh, another statistic I like to cite is India is the second most online country in the world. Uh, but it's also the most offline country in the world. It has the largest number of people without access uh, to the internet. Um, at the same time, India also faces a large number of very tough administrative and uh, uh, military reforms as it transitions from being what has historically been a much more inward-looking country to a much more outward-looking country. And it inhabits a very tough neighborhood. Uh, it has very large territorial disputes with Pakistan and with China and it's facing intensifying security competition in its immediate neighborhood and in the Indian Ocean region. So for the United States, uh, India is one of those countries that has always been important, but never <coughs> urgent. And this is something that successive administrations, starting perhaps from the Clinton administration onwards, have uh, had to uh, wrestle with. Um, it is not a, a US ally uh, on whom uh, there is a, a security, uh, there's, there's a, an expectation of a security guarantee, like, unlike NATO or Japan or South Korea nor is it uh, a historically an adversarial relationship uh, like, for example, China, Russia, Iran, or North Korea. And so for that reason, it's, it's often hard to get attention here in, in Washington for the relationship with India. That being said, it's encouraging to see such a large number of people here. Uh, and uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, what someone described as an all-star panel uh, to discuss uh, India's uh, engagements in a changing world. Uh, I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, to my immediate right, we, uh, my colleague Tanvi Madan, who is a fellow uh, here at Brookings, at the Brookings Institution and director of the India Project. Uh, Josh White, uh, to uh, my far right, who is a professor at, across the street at Johns Hopkins SAIS. Uh, he's also a non-resident fellow here at, Brookings, at the Brookings Institution uh, and previously served as uh, director in the National Security uh, Council for South Asia uh, in the Obama administration. And then uh, to my left is my colleague at Brookings India, Constantino Xavier. Uh, he's a fellow in foreign policy studies at Brookings India, uh, who specializes, amongst other things, on India's role in uh, India's relationships in its neighborhood and on India-Europe relations. What I'm going to do is, over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to have a few questions that I'll pose to all three of the panelists on a variety of issues. And then I hope to uh, bring all of you in uh, in the form of questions and comments from the floor. And what I thought I'd do is start off uh, from a sort of inside out uh, look. So start off domestically and then look at the, the broader strategic picture. So turning uh, first to Tanvi, um, India is set for a general election uh, sometime in the next six to eight months, uh, by, by the sp uh, most likely by spring of 2019. Uh, this will be the end of Narendra Modi's first term, uh, five year term. Um, and we are in some ways already in election mode uh, in, in, in India. Um, 
g tell us a little bit about what's happening domestically and how this might possibly impact India's external orientation. Uh, thanks, Trevor. And before I start, I just want to acknowledge somebody in the room, Steve Cohen, who's sitting here. Uh, our interest in our program on India and South Asia in Brookings would not exist without him. And I can arguably say at least three out of four of us would not be uh, where we are today if it wasn't for him. Uh, so thank you, Steve. And uh, please join me in just uh, giving Steve a round of applause. Um, now going to uh, something uh, uh, Dhruva asked about, which was uh, election season. Um, as many of you probably know, India is scheduled to go to the polls by April or May next year. Uh, and the debate is whether kind of on that kind of general election, the national election, is whether Prime Minister Modi's popularity that is reflected in what we see of opinion polls can really lead the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party to re-election, or whether, you, whether the op opposition can coalesce not, opposition being not just the Congress party, but a range of kind of especially regional parties can coalesce, uh, not just, it doesn't have to be nationally, it could be in particular st uh, key states, and either defeat the BJP or at the very least kind of reduce their uh, majority. And at the moment, the jury's out on that, but it seems more competitive uh, than uh, it would have seemed even a year ago, according to most analysts. Uh, in some ways, we are, though, already in election season. Some people say India is always in election season. Uh, but one of the reasons we are kind of already in election season is ahead of those polls. Uh, there are going to be elections in three crucial states uh, in India where the uh, BJP is the incumbent. And so those uh, states which are uh, going to go to the polls in December, January, uh, there's a question of whether they will be bellwether elections or not. Um, where, how does this all impact foreign policy? I mean, there's a whole range of issues where you can look at how kind of uh, external uh, developments can affect kind of the Indian domestic <coughs> political debate, et cetera, or kind of uh, Modi's elections prospects, including crises, uh, oil prices, uh, and developments like that. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about um, uh, just kind of what Dhruva asked about, which is how does the election, imp or how could the uh, election impact uh, foreign policy? Uh, we don't, by the way, have sufficient evidence that most Indians vote on foreign policy issues broadly, uh, but I'm going to lay out five areas where at the very least election season could have an impact, or in some cases has already had an impact, on kind of Indian foreign and security policy. I'd say f uh, first is defense procurement. We often talk about kind of uh, defense deals potentially with the U.S., others building Indian defense capacity, particularly given uh, a rising China and uncertainties related to that, uh, that India needs to kind of build its, uh, modernize its defense uh, uh, capabilities, et cetera. Having said that, for two reasons, there will be an impact. We've already seen an impact on defense procurement. One is the defense deal, as we're seeing with the, uh, the, defense, uh, the deal with France on to purchase uh, Rafale aircraft, which is that we're seeing kind of defense deals come under scrutiny. And it's essentially going to add to the slowdown in what is generally a slow system anywhere for procurement. Uh, everything comes under scrutiny. Deals are called, called into question. They essentially become political footballs. Second is the defense budget. There's been concern about kind of the, the kind of limited increase in India's uh, defense budget, but particularly on kind of capital outlays. And again, usually in election year when the government is more and kind of the couple of years leading into election, you're going to see the government spend more on social programs, uh, other areas where you're likely to see kind of a more of a return in terms of uh, political benefits. So we, we've already seen this year uh, that kind of the increase in capital outlays was 8%, which most people have said is not going to be enough for what India needs. Um, second, uh, economic policy, which has very much become uh, a part of kind of foreign policy. If you look at some of the reforms in terms of opening up uh, that, a num that would help kind of India's foreign relations with a number of countries, a greater liberal liberalization, we're unlikely to see major moves now for the next year. Things are essentially going to stall. And I think in particularly in one area, which is India's approach to trade, uh, it really needs a reassessment, and we're unlikely to see that because it gets, it, it does become a domestic political issue in India. Uh, uh, third area, uh, or rather, uh, third area is kind of uh, the kind of larger neighbors, which is China and Pakistan. Um, China has already become a political issue, and uh, what the government can do, can do or not do with China will be shaped by the fact uh, that each side has essentially been accusing the other of being soft on China. 
Um, similarly, kind of on Pakistan, any inclination that Prime Minister Modi might have to reciprocate what Imran Khan, the new government in Pakistan uh, under Imran Khan, kind of uh, had some outreach, there, it will shape kind of Prime Minister Modi's options, the fact that he's got elections and he is still kind of, uh, he's still sensitive to the criticism uh, that he rushed too far and fast with Nawaz Sharif uh, and was, uh, was kind of uh, rewarded with a part, an attack in Patankot. So he will be uh, keeping that in the back of his mind. Having said that, if he decides he wants to play that bigger role, uh, he could po potentially make the argument uh, that it's good for India and the Indian economy in the, in the long term. Uh, finally, or actually fourth, and I should add this because it was added later, so it wasn't finally, is India's smaller neighbors. Um, the, this is where kind of Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bangladesh, relations with them, which, are, which Tino's going to talk about, has been affected in the past by uh, domestic politics in the states around them. So with Sri Lanka, with Tamil Nadu, uh, with uh, Bangladesh, West Bengal, and now we're seeing it in India's northeast, particularly in Assam. And in, with Nepal, kind of uh, domestic politics in the bordering states in Uttar Pradesh, uh, which tend to affect this. So what India can do with these countries will be shaped uh, by what the government decides it needs to do in domestic political fact, uh, in, in the space in, in the run-up to the elections. Finally, I will say the U.S. Uh, parties in power in India uh, uh, tend to favor a deepening of, uh, when they're in government, it's all about uh, deepening relations with the U.S. When they're in opposition, they complain and criticize that very deepening. Um, and we've seen this, this is very consistent. Uh, the BJP, for example, uh, criticized and opposed the nuclear deal. Uh, now it's been very much moving further and faster with the US. Uh, during the, in, in practice, what we've seen though is since 99, this has been a deepening relationship. Uh, having said that, there's been little doubt that over kind of the last few years, the run rate in the relationship has picked up with an assist from China. And I apologize for mixing my sports metaphors. <laughs> but essentially, relations with the US have moved further and faster, particularly after the slowdown in momentum uh, in the last few years of the previous government. And the question will be uh, is, do we see, um, depending on who comes to power next year, whether Prime Minister Modi gets reelected, whether he has to have a coalition uh, whether there's uh, other parties coming back. Do we see the same momentum, particularly in the defense and security space? Um, the one good positive aspect is you do see, as this deepening continues, the domestic political kind of backlash against a deepening of this relationship has reduced. Uh, compare, for example, uh, the, uh, the kind of complaining and criticism of when US, the, the U.S. and India signed, it, signed the LAMOA, the Logistic Sharing Agreement, to now this past... Uh, this pa these past few weeks, India signing the COMCASA, or the Communications and Information Sharing Agreement, uh, it was the dog that didn't mark. mark. We haven't really seen uh, criticism on that front. So I'll stop there. Great, okay, thanks. Well, that's in some ways a, a, a sort of a tour d'horizon of the big issues that dominate the political space in, in India. And we can go in, into a little bit more detail. Uh, Tino, if I can turn to you. Um, uh, in some ways, we've seen uh, an intensification of activity, both positive and negative, in India's neighborhood uh, in, over the last few years, and we, that, that will probably keep up over the next few months. We have elections coming up in uh, several countries, the Maldives, Bhutan, uh, Bangladesh, and then uh, next year in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, Nepal has just had a transition, uh, a, new, a new government, and which is creating its own set of dynamics. So how, how would you say India has now uh, what are the new dynamics in India's near neighborhood, particularly Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and maybe to a lesser degree, Bhutan and Maldives? What, what are the key factors shaping those? So I think, I mean, what's most interesting is that traditionally, as Tanvi mentioned, uh, Pakistan figures very high uh, during election periods and election campaigns. China may be big, making a bit of an entry also occasionally. But for the first time now that we're coming into an election period again, the government is being judged also on its neighborhood policy, basically on its relations uh, with its small state neighbors. This includes Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bangladesh, a bit of relations with uh, uh, Myanmar to the east uh, following the government's uh, approach, which is called Look East or Act East to connect with Southeast Asia. But for the first time, actually, you have an emphasis now on evaluating what the government has done in the neighborhood. And while in the past, you know, foreign policy was sort of a wishy-washy thing, and many times, and many times, still is. And what are the, what is the state of relations? And you don't have very concrete indicators to assess what the government has done. 
for the first time you have a very concrete indicator of uh, to evaluate what the government is or not is, is not doing, which is the level of connectivity between India and its neighboring countries, which is really the next big game you're seeing in the region. Uh, India is trying to actively reach out to create interdependence with its neighbors, uh, to connect through physical infrastructure, roads, ports, uh, with its neighboring countries, which, it, which countries which it has neglected often for decades, right, and really uh, 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 ignored often, including their requests for <coughs> developmental support. Uh, so that's very interesting. We're starting to see in a very interesting debate within Delhi. And uh, no surprise, one of the main reasons why this is shaping up as a race for connectivity in the region uh, is the China factor. So it's in many ways paradoxical that you have the Indian government now waking up to its immediate neighbors, uh, to its own strategic backyard, if you want to call it, uh, because there is you know, a competitor uh, uh, looming around and actually delivering quicker, faster, and better than what India has done, uh, offered to these countries. So that's just sort of the background of why this matters and why it matters more than ever. Uh, these are countries which really Almost there's very little expertise often, even in India. Uh, people in think tanks, in scholarship, even within government, tend to look at the big picture, which means the relations with Pakistan, with China, with the United States, even Southeast Asia. India is a regional power in the Indian Ocean region. But it's often immediately at the sort of its doorstep in South Asia that the most important strategic challenges, I think, are being faced by the Indian government these days. So very quickly, three theses of what I see currently happening. I think first, for the first time, you have a government really uh, under Prime Minister Modi that has had a sustained neighborhood policy in decades. And that means actually not just saying neighborhood first, which is the main slogan of this government uh, on the region, saying you know we will focus first on the neighborhood. Uh, but it means actually putting in uh, efforts to implement, uh, to follow up on bilateral visits and relations with different countries in the region. So that's actually has been sustained by Prime Minister Modi. I think that's a, a piece of good news in that sense, that India's woken up in that sense to uh, its immediate periphery. But it's still far too little and often too late, and I'll come to that in a second. The second one is I think the intent for the first time from a strategic point of view is clear, what the region, why the region matters. It's no longer let's insulate this region uh, as our sort of economic non-aligned block or as a strategic backyard. It's become one where security means connectivity. So for, until the 1990s, if you talk to Indian officials within government across a range of organizations in the government, sec the security of India was defined as its level of insulation and separation from regions around, right? You wanted to be in your little protective cocoon in South Asia. You wanted to keep the Americans out. You wanted to keep the Chinese out. You wanted to keep the Brits out from the Indian Ocean at some points, the Soviets out of the Indian Ocean. But you had this idea of insulation of the region. And disconnectivity was actually seen as security. So you had a state actually dismantling connectivity of the 1940s and 50s, even during the imperial and colonial era. Uh, so paradoxically today, it's more difficult to cross several of these borders than it was in the 1950s and 60s, when the whole world embraced interconnect interconnectivity, interdependence, regional integration. In South Asia, you saw the exact opposite. Uh, and I think that's really a challenge now. And third, de I think derived of these two first uh, aspects, you have now an India that is much more open to working with other states within its own region. Uh, while in the past it was geared towards excluding regional powers from its own region, it's much more open now to working in partnership with Japan, with the United States, with some European countries in its immediate and sort of extended periphery, whether it's South Asia or the Indian Ocean region. And that's a very interesting development, which is new and I think speaks to India's recognition that you, know, you have to pool efforts, you have to work with like-minded partners, that's often the code word used for Japan, for the US, for other democratic powers, um, not necessarily to contain China or to stem the Chinese offensive, but at least to create a certain sense of division of labor, a certain coordination of efforts, uh, not to replicate uh, efforts everyone is sort of pursuing, and in some way increasing the pressure on the Chinese to deliver more, better, and being more transparent in their own projects, infrastructure project, projects, which have often been accused of lack of transparency, corruption, and another big word, debt traps in the region, of creating leverage in politics and security of these countries uh, uh, um, after creating economic uh, uh, influence in these countries. So just quickly to go through these three points in slightly more detail. The first one is the abysmal level of connectivity in the region. And I make this point because it's very difficult for 
Europeans, Americans, East Asians, Southeast Asians, even Africans often to understand how disconnected this region is, how difficult it is to cross borders, whether it's for capital, goods, people. Uh, South Asia today is, according to the World Bank, the least integrated region in the world. Uh, this is a country where India trades uh, uh, more with Nicaragua in Central America than with its neighbor Myanmar across its land border of 1,500 kilometers. So you have a variety of obstacles and barriers uh, to connect with it, your neighboring countries. You have uh, and often, as I mentioned in the past, more connectivity than today. With uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, former East Pakistan, you had uh, 12 railway links in the 1960s, allowing people to cross into then East Pakistan uh, and then uh, Bangladesh after 71. Today, you have two railway uh, links, uh, down from uh, 11. So you have a variety of difficulties in actually implementing connectivity on the ground. Uh, the Chinese are building a railway uh, into Nepal, at least have reached uh, southern Tibet, and now are thinking of extending it into Nepal across the Himalayas at five, 6,000 meters of altitude. Uh, India is not even able to build a single railway link into the plains of southern Nepal, forget Kathmandu, which is at an altitude of 1,500 meters. I actually looked at this. The Indian railways, uh, if you look at the five uh, highest altitude railway stations in India, you know India has the largest railway network in the world. Uh, the five highest altitude railway stations, uh, all of them were built b before 1920. So you've not been able to reach the mountains, the Himalayas, the various sort of mountainous areas in your border areas, including the northeast of India. And that poses a tremendous strategic challenge uh, for India to now perform on connectivity. Uh, think of connectivity also as institutions, all right? How do you deal with your neighbors through regional cooperation mechanisms, right? Uh, and often you have a total absence of any type of mechanisms in South Asia for countries to work uh, through regional organizations. SARC, which is a South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, created in the mid-80s, uh, has always been uh, subject to India-Pakistan tensions and a consensus clause which has hindered cooperation and consensus. Uh, you've had uh, now a focus on BIMSTEC, which is an organization for the Bay of Bengal, uh, includes Myanmar and Thailand, has a slightly eastern orientation. Again, tremendous difficulties in creating a stronger sense of regional institutions in the region because BIMSTEC has actually not performed very well despite having been founded back in 97. Uh, the second, uh, I think, challenge here besides the abysmal state of connectivity, which is a reality now, and I think the Indian government has realized that and therefore has focused on connectivity as a strategic objective, not just as an economic objective or any type of political orientation. You have the second challenge, which is, makes this even more difficult, which is you have your competitor, China, showing up at your doorstep and actually delivering on connectivity and creating ties with these small states around India, uh, which has created uh, a, a sense of competi competition with India. But it's also, it's not only a level playing field in terms of great powers trying to deliver more and better. They're very different modus operandi of how India and China operate in these third countries. And often, if I put it very crudely, if I go to Nepal uh, and speak to people there, for example, these days, which are facing you know, this very green grass across the Himalayas, China's coming in, supporting them, saying we're going to give you everything that India hasn't given you, it sounds very promising and very attractive, for, of course, for people in Nepal, which were, is a landlo landlocked country which depended on India. Uh, but the, the reality is that you've had often China coming in uh, with extremely uh, uh, um, questionable uh, criteria uh, in terms of its investments. Uh, investments that lack transparency, which create tremendous and unsustainable debts for these countries. China has also learned to play the political game. It's not a China that, stays, that says no strings attached, we will just uh, offer a lot of investment and not uh, influence any type of uh, politics or civil society in the host country. For the first time, the Chinese are actively uh, doing their influence operations in the region, creating their own think tanks in these smaller states around India, uh, buying off journalists, uh, playing politics in terms of creating government or supporting certain factions. And that's a tremendous challenge for India. You have now an extra regional power playing these games immediately at your doorstep. Because it's not just an issue of arrogance, if you want, or regional power of excluding China from the region. The India-Nepal border today is more open than the U.S.-Canada border, for example. There's complete free mobility of trade and people. Anything happening in Nepal obviously affects the security of India, India's border areas. So you want to be very careful what's happening in these countries, and that's the current concern uh, of, um, of India. And 
the, the crude way in which you can put this is often people in Nepal tell you, well, we have a poison gift from China. We know that. That's a tremendous uh, questionable terms of how the Chinese are penetrating our country and promising huge infrastructure development projects, which will, you know, undermine our good governance mechanisms. And let's not forget that most countries in South Asia now are finally democratic. For the first time since the 1940s, that all countries in South Asia now have democratically elected governments. So these are young democracies trying to establish rule of law, free press, a culture of pluralism in their institutions. And for the first time, you have China actually showing up and undermining these same institutions. So often the, the choice is a poison gift from China or no gift from India, which is very weak on delivery and slow and has tremendous capacity limitations in delivering uh, uh, on these economic assistance projects. So I think that's the challenge now. I think everyone recognizes that in Delhi. And the fact, and let me end on that, that you have now an outreach to the US and to Japan and other countries uh, from the Indian government to say, let's work together uh, because we actually think alike about development assistance, uh, the role of the private sector, uh, the importance of rule of law and institutions in these countries to equip them to monitor what they want or not accept from the Chinese, etc. So for the first time you have that emerging coordination happening. The Japanese have been the most proactive. You see a series of joint projects between India and Japan now in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, possibly Myanmar, uh, over the next years uh, taking off. And I think that's one of the most interesting strategic developments you see in South Asia today. Thanks, Tino. Um, Josh, looking now to India's west, um, we have a new government in Pakistan, uh, and yet we've seen India-Pakistan relations being in something of a deep freeze for the last two years at least, two and a half years. Um, at the same time, um, uh, we have developments underway in Afghanistan which have implications, obviously, both for Pakistan and, and India as well, and, and where the U.S. naturally plays a role. How do you see the, the, both the political development of Pakistan shaping up and, and the security situation in Afghanistan, and, and how, does, how is that affecting dynamics with India? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Dhruv. Uh, he always gives me the happy topics, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, just a few comments on Pakistan and Afghanistan and what they mean for India. There's a new government in Pakistan. Um, and every time there's a new government, there's a little spurt of optimism uh, in this town, usually misplaced. Uh, and I think what strikes me about this new government is an interesting and paradoxical situation in which there's a, a government that has a relatively strong mandate, but has a relatively constrained policy space. Uh, and this has implications for, for India. So the relatively strong mandate, you know, many people said in the run-up to the election, that the military was getting involved because it wanted to create a fragmented political outcome. To which I think we can see in retrospect that the military could have done nothing whatsoever and achieved a fragmented political outcome because that was probably the, the, uh, the trajectory of the, of the political um, arrangement. The military did intervene through judicial manipulation and I think it intervened in such a way as to produce a more stable uh, a government that has a somewhat stronger mandate under Imran Khan, uh, where he has a, um, been able to form a government at the center without having to cobble together a lot of small, volatile parties, and similarly in Punjab. Um, and so there's a, this is, in theory, a good thing. So in theory, a good thing for Pakistan, and in theory, a good thing for India, that you have a government that's a little bit more stable than uh, it certainly could have been. The paradox is that, uh, as is often the case in Pakistan, the policy space for the civilian government is constrained. And it's constrained perhaps even a little more than with some other governments in the past. And it's constrained for a few reasons. Uh, there is, first of all, a foreign policy division of labor that's very clear to those who have studied Pakistani history, in which the military dominates decision-making with respect to India and Afghanistan, uh, and then provides the, the civilians with a little bit more leeway in relations with China, the United States, the Gulf, and, and other countries. Uh, there's no indication that that general paradigm is going to change with this government. Second, there are constraints on federalism. There was a constitutional amendment some years ago that devolved many important powers from the federal level down to the provincial level. And even though Imran Khan holds the government in, in Punjab, it's not clear that he has enough expertise to be able to competently manage at the center and at the provincial level and deal with the fact that many of his authorities have been removed at the center. 
Uh, third, finance. There's a, a significant financial crunch. Pakistan is facing fiscal deficits, current account deficits. We'll probably have to go to the IMF. And the question is not whether austerity, it is what kind of austerity the government will embrace and on which terms. Uh, and then fourth, because I am using alliteration, uh, which I usually tell my students to avoid at all costs, but I am, uh, the fourth F is fanatics. Um, there, it, the government is, as with many Pakistani governments, under pressure from uh, various Islamic groups and militant groups that are constraining the policy space available for domestic reforms. So you, you put this together and you have a government that has some mandate and the ability to, uh, to represent the, um, the Pakistani people, but there's no indication as of yet that they have any interest in diverging from the Army's core interest. Um, and there are no obvious reasons for optimism on this count, at least in the near term. Uh, and I think that you know, uh, Indians are probably the most uh, realistic or cynical about this, and uh, their expectations are quite low. But this is a period in which uh, I wouldn't expect very much because of the political environment in India and because of the challenge that the Imran Khan government faces in dealing mostly with the profound economic problems that are going to consume it for the next six to nine months. On Afghanistan, uh, the other happy topic. Um, you know, my, my Indian friends uh, like to tell me that Indians are much more realistic about what's happening in Afghanistan than Americans are. And in one sense, I think they're, they're true. I think Indian elites are more realistic about the deteriorating security environment in Afghanistan than the Pentagon is. But then again, everybody is more realistic about the deteriorating security environment in Afghanistan than the Pentagon is. Uh, this is not unique to India. Um, I think they're very skeptical about, um, about what's happening in the security domain and in terms of the chaos that they expect in Afghan politics over the coming year. Um, and I think they're skeptical when they hear senior U.S. defense officials, like Secretary Mattis, say things like his, you know, his optimism is grounded in the non-quantifiable factors in Afghanistan. Um, so in that sense, I, you know, I very much appreciate the Indian point of view that things are, are moving in the wrong direction and that this will have implications for India's security over the long term that Americans don't always fully appreciate. At the same time, uh, I think that Indian elites tend to be unduly anxious about the reconciliation process with the Taliban, such as it is. Uh, and I think they're unduly anxious because, one, it's barely begun. Uh, we're at a very early stage in engagement with the Taliban over the future political dispensation in Afghanistan by all sort of historical analogs. Uh, second, nobody is on the verge of giving anything away because we are so early in this process. Uh, third, India has a stake because of its geography and its history, but it really is not a consequential player in the security environment or uh, really in the politics in Afghanistan. Um, and the United States seems to be slowly moving from a paradigm of Afghan-owned and Afghan-led negotiations to Afghan-owned and U.S.-managed or U.S.-oriented um, negotiations. The rhetoric's not there yet, but I think the process is moving there. And I think this is a good thing. I think it's long overdue. And it's something that the Indians are naturally anxious about. Uh, and I would hope that with the appointment of Zal Khalilzad, whose views on Pakistan are uh, known and are colorfully articulated uh, over the last several years, it will give the Indians some reassurance that nobody on the US side is interested in uh, making a deal in Afghanistan that will be that will uh, uh, negatively affect India's interests. So, sort of, to, I guess to conclude and, and putting that together, you know, Afghanistan has been an important part of the U.S.-India dialogue. And I remember when I was, you know, when I was at the Pentagon, we uh, we went out of our way to send military officers from Afghanistan to Delhi to walk through what we're doing and how we see the environment. And that relationship has matured. It's become a very important dialogue. But uh, India is still a relatively small player in the broader sort of uh, politics and strategic environment in Afghanistan. And I don't see that changing. And I still see us in an environment where we're managing anxieties um, and trying to be transparent about what we think is, is happening. Um, just go over uh, one more round of, of questions I have for each of them. And maybe if you can keep it brief, uh, because I, I want to bring in uh, the audience as well. Uh, Tanvi, um, another big uh, 
change in the last few years, and particularly from Washington's point, has been the embrace of the Indo free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, of which India is a big one element of, of that, uh, certainly. Um, this seems to dovetail increasingly with India's Act East policy. In fact, if you look at US-India joint statements nowadays, uh, these are the issues that, that appear at or near the top of, of the list. How would you assess uh, what's going on in this broader Indo-Pacific region from India's point of view, and how is India playing a role? Uh, I'm going to start kind of with China, because what is often forgotten is that China is very much part of the Act East strategy that India has. But it's also kind of, it's not the sole driver but it is a key driver of kind of India's approach to all the other countries in the region. Um, it shapes what India is willing to do or not do uh, with others. Um, and what we've seen with China essentially over kind of the last few months, I would say starting from about November, December last year, though it became publicly visible in the Wuhan summit this past summer, was a lowering of temperature between the two countries, uh, with both sides kind of driven by their concerns about reaching a tipping point uh, and kind of things getting very heated, which was very evident in Doklam last year, um, but also driven by their respective uncertainties about the U.S. I mean, it's essentially driven them to try to kind of lower temperatures, and that's what they've done. What we've seen is a revival of dialogues um, since, again, about November, December. We've seen increased kind of or, or revived military engagement, whether that's the Chinese defense minister going uh, to India or kind of discussions about... Um, uh, restarting the military exercises they have. Uh, we've also seen kind of a slight increase in aid, uh, in trade, uh, though we've also seen an increase in the trade deficit. And to some extent, the, they are less in, their, in each other's faces in the sense that we're not seeing uh, the differences be kind of uh, so starkly talked about. I think to some extent the relationship has kind of indirectly benefited from not a change in kind of the fundamentals of the China-Pakistan relationship, but some Chinese concern about the security and economic situation in Pakistan. Um, and so what some, I mean, some people have called this a reset, uh, and they were expecting kind of a major shift. And I think what we've also seen, and I think this was very evident during the U.S.-India 2 plus 2 dialogue, um, is that this reset is a reset in terms of a temperature reset, but not in terms of direction. That while the volume or tone uh, of India's approach to the region might have changed, uh, India's concerns uh, and the problems with China remain. Uh, nothing has changed. We haven't seen any structural shift. And the direction of India's policy remains the same. And you see, if you read Prime Minister Modi's Shangri-La dialogue speech, you kind of see these two elements. That, yes, trying to kind of... Uh, re-engage China, but fundamentally still has the same concerns. You see these reflected. Very quickly, I mean, what this has meant is deepening partnerships uh, with uh, various countries in what we're now calling the Indo-Pacific. And the idea to do this, uh, kind of deepen strategic security and economic relationships, has been to expand capabilities, uh, to shape the regional power balance, uh, but also because India sees these relationships as serving as force multipliers for it, both regionally and globally. So we've seen uh, deeper relations and more activities, more consistent engagement with Southeast Asian countries, uh, with East Asian countries, uh, while the relationship with Japan gets a lot of attention, and we will see more of that in October when the next Modi Abe summit takes place, uh, and a range of defense agreements are likely to be signed, including a logistic sharing agreement. Uh, the other country where India has also been engaging more actively is South Korea. Uh, President Moon was in India in July, and again, both economic and security agreements uh, were signed. Um, you're also seeing kind of India engage with kind of the other powers in the region. Uh, Josh is going to talk about the U.S., so um, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but Australia, which, um, you know, we talk a lot about kind of what the Quad isn't doing. And yes, there have been limits. Uh, India has been reluctant to upgrade the Quad. Um, because of its own concerns about provoking um, China, but also because it has concerns about where Australia sa stands on the issue of China. We have nonetheless seen uh, deeper engagement, particularly security engagement, bilateral engagement with Australia, as well as in a trilateral format with Australia and Japan. Uh, the other country that is often not seen here as part of the Indo-Pacific necessarily, but India sees very much as part of its Indo-Pacific policy is Russia. Uh, it sees Russia as part of its balancing China strategy, always has, and that partly explains why it continues to engage or want to at least keep Russia on side. Again, we'll see evidence of this 
uh, during the Modi, Modi Putin summit, which will take place in early October. Uh, I will outline just three kind of constraints slash weaknesses. One is, while there's been a lot of engagement, deepening of partnership, uh, the Modi government and India more broadly over the last uh, decade or so has had problems turn translating intentions into outcomes. Uh, and that has been kind of a, a key weakness. And that gets me to my second point. Part of this has been because of capacity constraints, because of connectivity constraints. But in this region in particular, it's partly because India doesn't have the kind of trade approach to trade or trade policy that it really needs to be part of the economic story here and not just the security one. Finally, I think India struggles, and it's not just India, I think many countries do, is, is this question of how do you prepare in some ways for, your for a rising China that you are increasingly concerned about without kind of wanting to provoke it? And India, in different parts and different phases, has different kind of ideas of what that balance is. And I would argue we're gonna, we might even see another change over the next year or so. But that creates some, con uh, some constraints in terms of uh, these other partnerships that India is trying to create. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, that was a very succinct uh, uh, summary in some ways of a very broad range of relationships in a very broad region. Um, Josh, if you could speak a little bit more, we've just had the 2 plus 2 summit, between, 2 plus 2 meeting for the first time between India and the U.S. This is the uh, Mike, uh, Secretary Ma Mike Pompeo and uh, James Mattis uh, went to India to, on, on September 6th. Uh, we've seen a number of other developments in the strategic bilateral uh, strategic space, including uh, India being elevated in the Department of Commerce's uh, regulation in terms of um, uh, the its status for uh, licensing um, uh, of, of, of certain uh, sensitive exports, um, which has now been facilitated. So c walk us through what, what's, particularly on the defense side, how do you see the U.S.-India bilateral relationship shaping up? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's, it's important to know that the, the United States had one of the two plus two sort of formulation for some time because it addresses some of the weird bureaucratic asymmetries in the relationship in which the Indian Ministry of External Affairs really holds uh, a lot of the key power on defense and security issues in the Indian system. And on the US system, a lot of the weight and energy has been on the Defense Department side. So to address that asymmetry, you get the two plus two in the room. And I think uh, what we saw was very positive. Um, and uh, you know, I've been critical of some things that this administration has done with respect to India, which I'll talk about in a moment. But this was a good meeting. Uh, there were important outcomes. The tone was positive, and it builds on a lot of what um, you know we helped to to set in motion at the end of the Obama administration in designating India as a major defense partner and uh, sort of creating the pathway for a lot of this. Uh, you know, just as an example, I won't go through the laundry list of everything that was agreed, new exercises and other things, but there was an agreement and a signing of the second uh, enabling agreement or foundational agreement that had been under discussion for over a decade. And just as an example of how much has changed and how, uh, you know, I was, in the, I was in the White House when we finalized the first of these agreements, which was a really a fairly dull logistics agreement, mostly having to do with accounting practices between the two countries. And it took a decade, and uh, like an hour before Modi was going into the Oval Office, we thought that the text had somehow been opened up again, and there was panic, and somebody was, you know, there was a call to the Pentagon, and somebody was running down the halls to pull a Pentagon lawyer out of a meeting, uh, and we finally got it all sorted out, and it happened. But it was, it was chaotic, it was stressful, and there was high drama over something that in and of itself was not that consequential. What we saw with this 2 plus 2 was a, really a signing of a sort of a follow-on agreement, which was substantively a lot more important. It's a communication security agreement, uh, more complicated, uh, touching on more issues related to sovereignty and technical exchange. And it was done with a lot of hard work behind the scenes, but very little public drama on either side. And I think that speaks to how far we've come and how well both governments have managed this process and try to depoliticize this process on both sides. So I, I give the governments a lot of credit for that. Um, uh, so you know there are other exercises and other things that were agreed upon that I won't go into. But what I think uh, a few challenges that remain in some ways were highlighted by their by their absence in this high level meeting. 
The first is, as Tommy mentioned, the Russia challenge. This was really, a, a, in part, a self-inflicted wound from the United States Congress, bless their hearts, uh, in trying to deal with the, the very real challenge that Russia poses to the United States. Uh, and this is complicated because the Indians want to buy a, um, a complicated system from Russia to which the United States does not have an alternative to provide. Um, and uh, so this, I think there's a pathway for a waiver. We'll see if the president chooses to give it. He probably will. But on the Indian side, I expect that the Indians will execute one of their famous maneuvers, which I call sign and stall, um, and will sort of slowly move forward with this um, in a way that that continues the, the dialogue. The other self-inflicted problem is on the Iran sanctions. And here, I think there's some interest on both sides in finding an accommodation in which India decreases its dependence on Iranian imports, and the United States finds some sort of car carve out for the Chabahar port, which allows for another line of communication into Afghanistan, serving our interests. Um, but the, the piece that, I, that I'll sort of end on that, that really worries me is on the trade side, which has been mentioned briefly. Uh, government to government trade relations have long been a problem between the US and India. And um, it's long been a sticking point. But I think what is different now is that we are no longer uh, unsuccessfully trying to grasp for an upside in the trade relationship, we are actively trying to prevent a lot of downside risk. And so when I was in, a, you know, in the administration, we had a lot of unrealized ambitions for the trade relationship. We talked about a bilateral investment treaty. Well, that ended up not working out. We talked about coordinating positions in the WTO. Well, that didn't work out. But we were trying to build a trade relationship that was moving forward. And we also had things like a focus on clean energy, climate change, global issues that we were partnering on. What we have today is a Trump administration that I think is weirdly obsessed with deficits, uh, with trade deficits and manufacturing goods. And um, what that results in is a relationship in which much more of the broader US-India relationship is resting on the shoulders of the defense and counterterrorism aspect of our cooperation, because the rest of it is really quite problematic. Um, and I think, you know, in the short term, this is understandable. Uh, trade will continue to be contentious. But over the longer term, this has some really pernicious effects. Uh, it disrupts the trust that has been slowly built up, the sense of American reliability as an economic and strategic partner. There are opportunity costs that we forego things that we could be doing together uh, because we're so focused on navigating economic issues that we brought up that some of which were un unnecessary, um, and it, it drains trust out of the system. So this is sort of my broader concern. A lot of positive things happening on the defense and security side, which we should note and applaud. But that's becoming a much more, uh, th that pillar is bearing a lot more weight than it used to in the broader conception of how the United States sees the value of this relationship. Uh, and I worry that that weight may, may not be sustainable over the long term. And uh, finally, Tino, um, another actor, uh, you know, we've spoken a little bit about China, the U.S. Um, another actor that India has been keen on engaging is Europe. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has visited 11 countries in, in Europe, some of them multiple times. Um, what has been going on in India-Europe relations? I mean, it's one of the most interesting developments in Indian foreign policy because uh, uh, I remember I worked for the EU presidency in 2007 in New Delhi. Uh, this is what more than 10 years ago now, and at that point you really had a paradoxically hostile relation often between the EU in particular and certain European countries and India. This was about climate change then, on which India and the Europeans had very different positions. It was about regulatory uh, issues like labor standards, um, environment. It was about free trade. It was about human rights and democracy promotion, where you had a very aggressive European position, often American too, uh, and a very defensive and hostile and sort of reactionary Indian approach saying, you know, these are all luxuries, these are all issues we do not uh, count as priorities as we develop as a rising economy. Uh, now, that has changed slightly. And uh, again, Tanvi started with China, so let me start with China too. China has helped this. And I say help because I think, as, Tanvi, as you mentioned, it's not necessarily the only driver, but it's, it's strange that among countries and, say, polities, if I call the EU as a political actor, um, which are 
think alike about certain global governance issues. They have not been talking to each other about these issues, and they've actually found themselves engaged in more difficult relations than with their, say, authoritarian counterparts. So often you had India's positions on certain multilateral issues uh, being much closer to the Chinese position at the United Nations, for example, than with the U.S. or European countries. This was a past. Now, the rise of China in its sort of structural way, the capabilities of China, the economic rise of China, ch the militarization, I think, in some ways, or securitization of Chinese economic entanglement across Asia, has led India to reach out to these various partners and begin at least a dialogue about issues which had not been often on the table. Uh, and have allowed, I think, India and the Europeans in particular to look alike at certain, or to look the same way at certain uh, uh, common challenges. And in particular, I think on the Indian side, there's a variety of factors which have um, led to a greater, uh, I think, or more pragmatic approach towards the importance of Europe. Uh, the first one is a recession. Uh, let's not forget that the EU as a common trading bloc is India's largest trading partner. Uh, so that set off some alarm bells in Delhi and saying we cannot take Europe as an economic power and as an engine of growth which favors us as granted. Um, so there's a bit of curiosity and concern there. Um, I think Brexit uh, was an important uh, factor, again, is an important factor in how India is looking again at Europe. Because strangely often, uh, I think in India, there's a temptation to look at Europe, the European Union, Europe in general, through British eyes, through London. That's an old tradition, and I think that's no longer viable. And I think uh, uh, that's realized in Delhi now, that you have to engage more with France and Germany, uh, smaller states in Europe, which are going to take a driving role in the European Union, in the larger European uh, bloc. Uh, you've had the refugee crisis and security issues coming up. I think there's a realization that Europe and India share a common periphery. Uh, in the Gulf in particular, uh, even in the Indian Ocean region, where the Europeans are also concerned about the stability and issues like freedom of navigation. Uh, so I think there's a sort of common periphery, which I like to define as being one between Moscow and Mauritius, if you look at it from a north-south angle, uh, across Eurasia and the Indian Ocean, and a west-east sort of a link between Istanbul and Islamabad. This is a crucial area for both the Europeans and Indians on a variety of sectors. Uh, which I think is share and which has led to a very important security dialogue also between European countries and uh, India. So, for example, now you have for the first time uh, a sense of a certain dialogue which is also trilateral between European countries, India, and certain Asian countries. Uh, recently in Delhi, there was a dialogue, for example, between on the Indian Ocean region, the maritime security between the French, the Indians, and the Australians for the first time. Now, this is unthinkable 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and that's a very interesting development because it shows, I think, on the, on the Indian side, a certain curiosity, a certain concern, and a certain realization that Europe <laughs> matters. Despite actually being quite weak and facing challenges, it, it matters more than ever uh, for India. And the China story is, of course, an important one because, as we know, China has been uh, extending its economic leverage uh, over several European countries. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is an interesting example because several European countries went in quite positively and optimistically into this Belt and Road Initiative. And over the last nine months, I would say, um, you have an emerging debate within Europe on, again, the terms and implications of Chinese investments across Europe. So you have the European Commission now coming up with a voluntary opt-in screening mechanism for uh, foreign investment, which is clearly geared and directed at Chinese investments an internal debate in Europe of uh, whether that is uh, important or not, and to what extent you have to have a common European position to protect uh, Europe from long-term, uh, again, debt traps, if you want, uh, uh, which the Chinese have uh, sometimes uh, uh, developed in their relationships with other countries. So strangely, you have a similar debate in South Asia and in Europe happening these days, and I think that's bringing Europe and India uh, closer together. Thanks, uh, Tino. Um, I would like to open up uh, for a question, but I thought I'd just briefly summarize. Uh, there were just a few thoughts that um, seem to be kind of common threads across a lot of what I heard. Uh, one is that I think we heard a lot about China in almost every uh, one of those uh, interventions, whether it was uh, in the context of relations between India and the US, Southeast Asia, uh, Pakistan, the neighborhood, Europe even. Uh, how much China is now shaping and, and is the primary, not the sole, but certainly the primary driver of India's own external engagements. Uh, second is, uh, is, in many cases, there seem to be a clearer, uh, a cl greater clarity of intent on India's part, but still very much question marks about execution and outcomes. Uh, 
And uh, that, I think, is another common thread that I, uh, that I picked up. And the third is that while se things seem to be progressing quite um, uh, systematically and clearly on the diplomatic and security fronts, particularly in relations with uh, the US, Russia, Japan, Australia, and others, uh, that uh, things are less uh, optimal on the trade and economic side, uh, with the possible exception maybe of Afghanistan, where perhaps the reverse is uh, true. Um, but in any case, these were just some of the common uh, threads that I that seemed to, to pick up from, from all of your uh, comments. One of the nice things about be doing an event like this in Washington is that uh, we could very well have been in reverse. Uh, we have enough people in the audience here who could very well have been on this panel uh, and us be in the audience. And amongst uh, Steve Cohen, Ambassador Tazy Schaefer, uh, I think Strobe uh, Talbot, former Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Robin Rayfeld, former Assistant Secretary of State, amongst many other people in this August audience. So uh, I would very much like to invite a few questions and comments. Uh, feel free to uh, keep your comments and questions brief. Uh, and then maybe I'll direct them to, to uh, panelists. So I had uh, Tazi Schaefer first. And then we have three here. And then I'll go into the back of the room. So uh, the microphone's coming. Thank you, Dhruva. I wanted to pick up the last point that you made and some of the points that uh, Josh made about trade. Uh, I think uh, you're certainly right that trade has become, um, once again, and in very familiar ways, mm -hmm. a troublesome issue between the United States and India. Having been a trade official for four years of my life, one of the basic principles you have to remember is when you have trade, you have trade problems. And when you have increased trade, you have more trade problems. <laughs> Uh, that's just the nature of the beast. The other basic principle is that trade is a domestic issue. It's a domestic issue for the United States. It's a domestic issue for India. It's a domestic issue for everybody. So that is really the arena where the um, domestic politics are uh, colliding. And they're colliding in a foreign policy sphere. You didn't say anything about India's multilateral policy and priorities. But this is a very interesting case because uh, one of the, thing, the techniques that India has perfected over the years is that when it doesn't want to go along, it's perfectly happy to say no, kick the table over, say hell no, um, and uh, everybody acts shocked. Um, so I would expect that trade will continue to be a problem. You can't just sit back and say let it continue to be a problem, though. That is going to put great demands on both governments for creativity. Mm -hmm. Demands that in the past they have been able to meet when they really wanted to get some version of yes for an answer. And I offer you the agreement on mangoes and motorcycles. Mm -hmm. The motorcycles were, it was Harley's back then too, uh, which was celebrated by Kamal Nath and Sue Schwab having a huge bash at the Chamber of Commerce with baskets of luscious mangoes. I must confess, I put one in each pot. <laughs> um, it's also the way we solved uh, a problem with the um, uh, airline regulations, op the open skies problem. Uh, it's a way that we solved a dairy problem whose clone has cropped up again. Um, and it has to do with animal feed of the cows producing the milk. Um, so that's what we're going to have to reach back to. And don't expect them to go away. The one, we hope that we'll make these go away at least for a while, but some others will come up. It just will. Sir, uh, right in front. Uh, this gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Joseph Colomer. I'm teaching uh, Georgetown Democracy and Governance. And, of course, India is the largest democracy in the world and has very interesting problems of governance. And I'm a little surprised that nobody has mentioned its role in international and global institutions, in particular uh, the G7, G7. Uh, which was created for the largest uh, economy, democratic economies. At that time, India was not one of the largest in, in economic terms, but you mentioned now maybe the sixth or the fifth, and it would be time to be in, right? And uh, even more interesting because China is not a democracy and Russia was ousted from the group. So uh, my question is whether there is any plan or initiatives to try to be incorporated in particular to the group of seven, but perhaps even more active in some other global institutions too. Thank you. 
and then the one in the front here, yes. I'm Robin Walker with the State Department. Uh, I appreciate this kind of tour of Indian foreign policy here. We could have kept going around past Iran to the Gulf and Africa mm -hmm. as well. So if anybody has any comments on the Gulf, I'd welcome those as well. Um, but as India continues to have its all of the above strategic autonomy foreign policy, what do you see as either the gaps forming between that or the areas of conflict um, that having an all of the above foreign policy brings? Thanks. Uh, could you just, uh, what, what do you mean by all of the above? Foreign so. India has a foreign policy for everything covering uh, good relations with Russia, good relations with the United States, trying to improve relations with China, um, trying to do something on Pakistan. Where do those conflict? Okay, where, right. where, what are the, the areas of conflict sure. um, that ha trying to have good relations or at least decent relations with everyone is going to bring coming up in the future here? Sure. So uh, I'll take another round of questions in just a second. But just to, to summarize, I mean, on uh, trade issues, um, I, I think the best answer might be, uh, I would recommend everybody read Taisy Schaefer's book uh, on India, the, <laughs> the, the Global High Table, uh, which, which covers multilateral negotiations. Uh, but uh, I would just add, a, and w maybe somebody else wants to address it in more detail if we have a little bit of time, but the areas where trade negotiations are really going to come up, uh, and, and this is going to enter domestic politics, uh, will probably first be on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership negotiations. Mm -hmm which are expected where, where there's, there is a stated goal to finish those negotiations by the end of the year. This involves ASEAN plus six other economies, Australia, New Zealand, India, China, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, and India has been holding out on a number of issues uh, that have a particular domestic uh, resonance. So, so I think that that may be the test case uh, for where how India will, uh, will, will shape its trade policies uh, to, to come. Uh, Tina, would you want to address the question of Indian, uh, India is a democracy and what it means for its role in global institutional leadership. I mean, the G7 may not be forthcoming, but there's certainly other venues for that. What would you so just quickly on, on trade, economics, and security. From the vantage point of the region, it's very interesting that you have, say, the China story, which trade. is one of economic entanglement with East Asia and Southeast Asia for decades now. Uh, and now the securitization of that, right? The political implications that. What's very interesting is that in India, I think it's a function of India's economic closeness, and it's really one is still one of the most closed economies among the great powers. Uh, you have now the language of security of China, right? China's a threat. Uh, any type of free trade agreement between one of our neighboring countries and China is a concern for India. And that's a shortcut. That's a security shortcut, because what you have to do, rather than denying uh, some of your neighboring countries and other countries in the region economic linkages with China, is delivering better and more. And you can only do that if your own economy is open. That's just a moment, I think, on, on the strategy of and economics and, and security and the, how it's thought of or not thought of, actually, in India, which is, I think, concerning, because there is a logic of economic openness which would favor Indian security interest in the long term. And I'm not sure in Delhi that's very apparent these days. Now, on democracy, I think the... Uh, you know, we tend to think of India, and I think Indian government officials are to blame for this often, to say that we don't care about values, democracy, that we are one of the most agnostic democratic powers in the, in the world, in the sense we do not uh, transpose what's happening inside the dem democratic success story of India into our foreign policy. Now, that's not exactly true. If you look at the history of India, India has always understood that greater liberalization, democratic liberalization in neighboring states and in other developing countries in particular is in India's long-term security interest. Uh, it's always not acted in that way, nor has the United States of America or any other democratic power. We know about the tensions and dilemmas of democratic foreign policies, but it certainly had that instinct. Now, again, coming to China, what China has done, it's activated its link in India that China coming out with a slightly different model or slightly undermining often institutions uh, in the countries where it invests has led for India to think, I think, more strategically about that link, uh, the importance of uh, working together with other democratic powers and strengthening other small state democracies around the world. This is a story also behind India and Europe, India and Japan, India and the U.S., and it's not necessarily about electoral institutions, parliamentary institutions, or multilateral institutions, which you mentioned. Uh, it's also about issues simple like data governance, right, or data security. How do you deal with private information from citizens? Do you follow a statist authoritarian model? Do you follow a complete decentralized, decentralized model? So there's very interesting debates happening these days in India uh, on governance, public policy issues, and foreign policy issues, which reflect, I think, a clearer thinking of 
democracy not as a luxury or an issue we just inherited it from the Brits and we happen to be democratic, but actually more strategically about the long-term benefits for sustainable governance, <laughs> stability, security, economic growth, uh, domestic resilience of institutions when you face authoritarian states which are trying to penetrate these spaces. So that's one of the most interesting developments I see in Delhi these days. And that opens a huge uh, potential for partnerships with the United States, with Japan, with European countries on exchanging assessments uh, at the multilateral level, at the bilateral level, and also working together in third countries to promoting, if you want, those democratic institutions, which I think made the US, India, and Japan uh, more robust societies. Uh, Josh, do you want to touch on the trade issue quickly? Yeah, and just very briefly, I think Ambassador Schaefer raised a very important point about the political uh, political economies and the domestic politics of trade. And on the Indian side, that's quite clear. Uh, there's a reluctance to liberalize uh, in agriculture because it's an important political base. There's a reluctance to liberalize in retail, the retail sector because there's a middle class that is um, sort of a trading class that's very important. I think what's different about this moment is that in the United States, the trade demands are not coming from the Congress. They're not coming from very clear, very clear political base. In fact, the Congress has been pretty skeptical of the steel and aluminum tariffs and a lot of the other demands. Uh, they're coming from a president who, uh, I mean, if there's a silver lining, it's that the Indians should recognize this negotiating style of the president, which is lead with bombast, uh, ask for 100, hope to get 10. Uh, and I think that it's coming in a different way from the United States than it usually does, not with deep political economy roots, but the style should be familiar to the Indian bureaucracy, and that's why I have some hope that they'll be able to find space on a few narrow issues, both call it a win, uh, and hopefully have the president turn his gaze somewhere else in the world. <laughs> I, I, I like to summarize this by saying India needs to provide Trump with more spice jets and fewer Harley Davidsons. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, oh, I'm the Gulf and uh, the all of the above. All strategy. of the above um, You know, I think there's one. Way, there's a way to answer. The Middle East is actually a good example of India having an all of the uh, above strategy, and I think you know you see that part of that is driven by the fact that India has, because of its trade dependence, uh, because of its diaspora, because of its it's one of the largest energy importers, because of its kind of economy broadly, but its strategic needs as well largest, uh, one of the largest importers of military equipment. It has interests in all these countries. So in some ways, this all of the above strategy has been about having choice, creating choice for India. But India has also tried to make the strategy about avoiding making choices. And so I think you see this in the Middle East, uh, where um, I think, I mean, for those of you who don't know, India has between six and seven million uh, Indian citizens who work in that region, and I say between six and seven million because it has ranged over time, um, it, is, it continues to be, that region continues to be the largest source of oil uh, imports for India, significant source of gas imports uh, for India. Uh, India has increasing security ties with not just Israel, which has always been, a def I mean, for years been a defense and intelligence partner, uh, but also with some of the Gulf countries. Um, and as it thinks about maritime security more broadly in the in kind of the uh, Western uh, Indian Ocean, that is becoming a factor as well. And I think what's happened recent in recent years is, for the first time, India has leveraged with these countries. So they aren't asking neither the the Gulfies on both sides of the GCC divide are asking India to make a choice, nor are the Israelis, and nor are the Iranians. So the Iranians try it, and India pushes back. And so India has to maintain these three sets of uh, relationships. And it's all about, and, and it is becoming an increasing player. And I'll give you two instances which show how India very quietly has become a player in the Middle East in a way that doesn't get reflected. One is the blockade of Qatar. And the fact that India, because there are more Indian citizens in Qatar than they are Qataris, uh, broke the blockade. Uh, and did not, I mean, while they might have, the Saudis and the Emiratis might have tried to push back, they didn't uh, to a great extent. They understand that India needs to do that. Second, the fact that Air India has a Delhi Tel, Tel Aviv flight that the Saudis have allowed to fly for the first time uh, over Saudi airspace. The fact that it was India that managed to get this through and not another country. So I think it's becoming more relevant, but it also mean that it's sometime going to have to make these choices. And so that's kind of more on the between Iran, say, and the Gulfies, or kind of Iran and Israel. 
When it's not asked to make choices, it's very happy. I think where you do see the choice play out is something that Josh mentioned, Russia. It's relations with Russia and the U.S. On the one side, it needs more, both countries, or says, thinks it needs both countries for China balancing strategy. Uh, but we've, we're seeing it very starkly. Over the last decade, it, the U.S. hasn't asked India to make a choice between its relationship with Russia and its relationship with the U.S. In some ways, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, the, the CATSA, uh, makes this almost a choice. And then the question of whether or not India gets a waiver uh, becomes kind of that negotiation about how much of a choice India needs to make. This is linked to the trade question, of course, and a broader issue that India is having to grapple with, uh, with the US, uh, which is that, and I think this is where the trade part is different this time, is with the Bush and Obama administrations and towards the end of the Clinton administration. There was an argument uh, that this was a strategic relationship in the sense that the U.S. would make an investment in India for the long term and would look the other way um, or make, you know, kind of dampen trade frictions, deal with differences. Uh, today, it's more transactional. President Trump wants short-term uh, returns, and India is having to figure out how it does that. So for a waiver, the question is, what will he demand in return? Is it something on the trade side? Is it a defense deal for the U.S.? This is something I don't think India would necessarily have had to grapple with two years ago. And I think this is having, making India have to make choices, decisions that it would ideally have liked to avoid. Uh, several hands on this side of the room. So uh, maybe Tom Breckenridge here, and then the two back here. And then, and yes, so. Hi, thank you. Tom Breckenridge from Boeing. Thank you, first of all, for these very interesting perspectives. Uh, defense question for you. Coming out of the positive momentum that we have from the 2 plus 2, what do you see as either the next big deliverable in the relationship, either what that is going to be or what do you think it should be? Thank you. Um, the gentleman back here in the red tie. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations for this really very interesting and useful uh, panel. My name is Gonzalo Paz from Georgetown University. Um, what is the role of India and, and the vision of India for the BRICS? Uh, and I have a second version of this question, more short term. Uh, there is a sense inside the BRICS that there are diminishing returns for the organization. And China and Russia are um, trying to expand the, the membership. And, and, and Pakistan have emerged as, as a contentious issue. How do you see this, uh, the, the possible evolution of the BRICS and, and the role of India in, in it? Thank you. Thank you. One, um, I think the gentleman, yes, with his hand up there, was waiting quite patiently. Uh. Um, hello, I'm Rick Rowden. I'm, uh, I'm doing my PhD at JNU in New Delhi. Um, I have a question about the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, it didn't get very much press coverage in the West last year, but I thought it was pretty significant that both India and Pakistan have become full members of the SCO last year. And I want to know, what is your take on the SCO? How do you understand it, and how do you see its agenda? And then my question is, can India really both be a, a full member of SCO and also participate in the Quad in the way that the U.S. would like? Thank you. Um, this, uh, maybe one more question here, the gentleman in the aisle. Uh, right there, yeah. Thank you. A very interesting discussion. I'm unaffiliated, but I have an abiding interest in India. Uh, on the Indian economy, has India missed the manufacturing revolution? And since most of the developed countries are uh, growing because of high tech, India's budget in R&D is minimal, both in the corporate sector and in the government sector. How do you think that's going to impact the Indian economy? Uh, big question here. Um, what we can do, um, uh, Josh, maybe you, if you can address the 2 plus 2, uh, what, what's the next big deliverable on the defense front? And Tanvi, maybe on the BRICS, SEO, and Quad. Um, and then uh, Tino can pitch in. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, it's a great question on defense and security. I mean, there are sort of three things that come to mind in this space broadly. Uh, one are the defense deals on the horizon, and they're always... Uh, large defense procurements on the, on the horizon. Uh, India has developed a uh, convoluted new system of trying to broker uh, 
awkward relationships uh, between U.S. and Indian firms, and this is still a work in progress. Um, but I, I think, you know, seeing if India can move forward at a reasonable speed with large defense procurements in, a, in the light of a strategic environment where it very clearly has some uh, some challenges from China's growing naval reach and other things is something that, that a lot of us are, are watching. And it's not just a question of whether they can do these in a timely way, but you know the S-400, uh, the, the Russian surface-to-air system, has precipitated a really interesting set of uh, questions and really a conundrum for India that it hasn't grappled with, which is that uh, it used to be that you could buy your defense stocks sort of piecemeal. You know, you buy this system from this country and this system from this country, and you try to make a few things on your own, and 10% of the time it works, and the rest of the time, you, you know, you buy it off the shelf. Um, but technology is such that we're living in a different world now, in which you don't just buy things, you connect them all together. You network them together in ways that makes it quite problematic, in fact, looking over the next 10 to 20 year horizon to buy a Russian air defense system and high-end US fighters and cyber systems from somebody else. Because these all talk to each other and there are intelligence challenges and interoperability challenges. So moving toward a more networked paradigm of warfare, which is where India should be, uh, they're going to have to change to some extent the paradigm of uh, the sort of motley force that they built over the years. And the S-400 is, I think, is prompting some of that. And they haven't had to confront some of those decisions, but will. So I think that's, that's one thing I would be looking at for that the US is watching closely, how India navigates that challenge. Uh, the other is moving forward with some other agreements that are on the horizon. BECO, which is uh, an important geospatial agreement, which will help us in maritime cooperation, and some agreements that will facilitate industrial cooperation on sensitive topics. And then the third is really something that, you know, I think many of us in the U.S. would like to see our cooperation move from a lot of exercises to a lot of exercises and some joint activities. We can call them joint patrols. We can call them parallel patrols. We can call them, look, we happen to be in the same place at the same time doing similar things. Uh, the labeling is less important than uh, a sense of doing things together in the region because so much of the way that, that the Defense Department thinks about technology transfer has to do by asking the question, uh, what are we doing together? And do we need to share skills and technology to facilitate what we're doing together? And so to move, to inch toward that operational space in ways that are, don't have to be threatening for India, don't have to be threatening for China, I, I think would be, you know, is an important part of the horizon of, of where I think we can go in the next five to 10 years. Uh, it, just a specific elaboration on, on what uh, Josh was saying. Uh, the procurement of uh, the S-400 uh, severely complicates uh, India acquiring in the future a fifth generation fighters from the United, a, sp a specific fifth generation fighter from the United States, which is currently an issue uh, for Turkey that is conf Turkey is confronting now, but uh, India will may have to confront mm -hmm. such yep. choices in the future. Right. Um, uh, Tanvi. Um, I think you know so uh, Trevor asked me to answer the SEO, the BRICS, and uh, the Quad question. And they are related because in some ways they all pivot around this question of the C factor, China. Um, and I think specifically, at least BRICS and SEO, um, a lot of where it goes, I think, depends on the China-Russia relationship. And to some extent, there's an underlying assumption when India is buying major, considering buying major platforms from Russia or kind of trying to keep it on side. There's an underlying assumption that what happened in the past will happen again, which is that this, what used to be the Sino-Soviet partnership, now the Sino-Russian, is not going to last. That they have kind of uh, different interests. And because they have different interests uh, and, and will kind of conflict in Central Asia, other places, uh, that Russia, by kind of sponsoring Indian membership, pushing Indian membership of kind of the uh, uh, Indian membership, the SEO, or kind of occasionally bandwagoning with India at the BRICS, being supportive of it, uh, that essentially Russia will facilitate kind of an Indian role, uh, an Indian capacity, but that also uh, its relationship with China is not going to be a big strategic issue. And at some point, there has to be questions in India that perhaps are within government about the fact that uh, we haven't seen that division, divergence, 
uh, right now play a big role between China and Russia, but also potentially what would it mean in a crisis if India needs spare parts, say, um, and the Russians have not refused to supply them, at least slow it down like they did during the 1962 war. Uh, and what should that mean? Should that be a question raised? While everybody discusses U.S. Un uncertainty and unreliability of the U.S., I think you will start to hear questions. There are already some within the military in India about uh, how reliable Russia will be because of its relationship with China. So I think this, where BRICS goes will depend on that China-Russia China, China -Russia relationship because, as you said, in the last few sessions, India has noticed that Russia has not necessarily been backing it up. It's been backing China up. Uh, but then India also finds BRICS a useful uh, forum to actually engage with China, um, engage with uh, Brazil and South Africa, but also get China to be, perhaps accidentally and unintentionally, on record as criticizing Pakistan sometimes uh, on counterterrorism. So I think there are uses to it. Um, can it balance the Quad and SEO and BRICS? Yes, that's part of the all, ab all of the above, this thing. Nobody's asking it to make a choice. The question is, qualitatively, what is it doing? So when people make a big fuss saying, oh, it's doing exercises with all, uh, th in all three groups, or at least two of them, the question is not, is it doing an exercise or not? The question is, what is the uh, n uh, nature of that exercise? What is the consistency? And you know, you can look with, with when people are measuring, say, the quad, is it, is it successful or not, et cetera. It depends on what you expected of it. Uh, it's already meeting on a more frequent basis than, say, the trilaterals that India has. It's met twice. It's going to meet again uh, later this year from what we understand. And so the question is, you can call it Coast Guard, anti-piracy, human humanitarian assistance, the disaster relief cooperation, but another term for it is maritime security. Uh, and so you do see that happening in a way an SEO exercise is not doing. So can India do all of it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's done it before. It will continue to do it. It's when it's asked to make choices that it then has to confront the problems. And I think what Josh just outlined uh, essentially points out one of the challenges of India's diversification strategy in the defense space, which earlier it could buy you know, planes from three different countries. Uh, this is going to be, or it could have engagement with three different. If China and Russia really do become uh, closer and closer, then I think you'll start seeing India even make choices about kind of SEO bricks and uh, quad. Uh, I mean, maybe another way of, of uh, that point on the exercises, uh, are they confidence building exercises or are they interoperability exercises or you know, maybe one way of thinking about them? Uh, you you want to finish yeah. on the SEO? Yeah. yeah, just, I mean, it's a question from my alma mater, JNU, so I need to reply as a former JNUite. But uh, <laughs> I think just to bring in a bit of a skept note of skepticism also on some uh, of these issues. Uh, the first one, I mentioned my economic argument about this economic openness becoming a strategic imperative for India. And again, I'm not sure that is always realized in Delhi, but it's becoming more and more apparent that it will only be through economic independence and openness that India will be able to deliver more and be more integrated with its neighbors in the larger Asian region. The second challenge I see uh, examples of every single day when I'm in Delhi and interact with the government and foreign governments and foreign embassies when I'm in Delhi is one of capacity. So you can have, uh, and in particular, bureaucratic capacity. So you have an India that's really performed very well in reaching out. Prime Minister Modi has been to, what, 42 countries, uh, 80 visits abroad, more than the previous prime minister in both terms together in his first term. Uh, a variety of initiatives, which I think are very welcome and important. But you have, I think, several other countries across Asia now asking themselves, you know, can we really rely on India? And for these, these countries, this is a survivability issue often. Uh, they are facing a tremendous offensive from the Chinese, a lot of investment, a lot of support. They're concerned sometimes from China. This is Southeast Asian countries, uh, countries committed to ASEAN and regional integration and multilateralism in ASEAN is coming under stress. And they want to see more of India. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, a welcome development. But in terms of capacity to deliver, whether it's on, again, economic projects, assistance, but also even human resources capacity. The Ministry of External Affairs in India today uh, has a diplomatic corps which is equivalent in terms of size to Singapore or New Zealand. Less than 1,000 diplomats to represent the interests of India of 1.3 billion people abroad. Now that is going to be I think a key challenge for the Indian government to reform its decision-making apparatus whether on trade issues, climate change issues, defense issues uh, and that's I think going to be one of the most stressful issues for the government to deal with in order to perform
and accord according to and perform according to the promises I think uh, it's made to several countries and regions around the world. I think we have time for maybe one or two last questions. So uh, maybe one right in the back and then some ma'am in the front. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, good morning. I'm uh, Ross Conley from the National Defense University. Um, with uh, India and the U.S. moving closer together, particularly on security things, is India doing anything to address this with Pakistan? Maybe any way of like softening the blow, or, or is India just saying we're doing this for our own interests and we're not interested in what Pakistan thinks? Thanks. Um. Thank you. Um. I'm Marina Fazel, um, an African-American journalist, and I would like your feedback on what can the uh, new relationships with India, how can it uh, facilitate a peace with the Taliban? Um, I know that the world is in a very ideal place, and uh, these are very complex negotiations, but uh, obviously a large part of the dynamic between United States uh, between uh, Afghanistan, uh, the various parties involved, have to do with the com uh, conflict between India and Pakistan that has for a long time played a role there. So if you could please tell me what could the Indian uh, government do to nudge the process in Afghanistan, move towards a peace solution with the Taliban? Thanks. Do you want to take a question? Maybe do you have Yeah, and then do, yeah, do you have Phoenician, and then you could take the Afghan question. Um, so... I mean, it's an interesting question kind of on the dehyphenation because it's almost asking the opposite question. I mean, essentially what we've seen, not just in the last year or so, but it, or we've seen a trend in the U.S. of um, there used to be a sense that there was hyphenation, that everything you did with India had to be measured against how would Pakistan react. Um, similarly, the opposite. And that put constraints, uh, puts constraints on what the U.S. would do with India. And to some extent, what the U.S. would do with Pakistan. Pakistan is, has been useful to the U.S. in phases, so that's not always been uh, the case. What we've seen kind of over the last decade or so is that essentially the U.S. has made a judgment uh, that these are separate. Now, you can argue it's not feasible, but essentially that these are two separate, these are going to move on two separate tracks, which is that it is going to do a nuclear deal with India even if the implications with Pakistan, and for that matter, China. In fact, if there is a hyphenation today, it's perhaps the US, India, and China in some ways. But that essentially, these are going to be dehyphenated. That there's going to be a US-India policy and US-Pakistan policy. Uh, now, some of that is you do see that in places like Afghanistan or related to Afghan policy, this becomes a little more kind of convoluted in the sense that these things are linked. But at least what, has, what we've seen a trend of is that uh, the U.S. has essentially said, we are not going to let uh, uh, relations with Pakistan be a veto on what we need to do with India. And that's because it's become, India has become part of a broader frame. The U.S. has taken India out of South Asia and made it an Asian or an Indo-Pacific country. And so kind of the, the imperatives to do with uh, the rise of China, et cetera, have made this a secondary uh, concern. Uh, for India as well, the same thing, where there's almost, it's not a question of they don't necessarily care about the impact of Pakistan. For India, the security challenge that it sees uh, between China, with China and with Pakistan are linked. And so for it, when it's building capacity on the defense side, it's not just about whether or not Pakistan will care. It is partly about Pakistan. Uh, now, you can argue that that creates complications in the region, uh, but these, and, and you even see this on the nuclear side, right? Pakistan reacts to India. India is reacting to China. China is reacting to the U.S. So while we think of these in dyadic terms or even dehyphenated terms, they are all linked. And I think this is one of the issues uh, that while how do you pursue dehyphenated relations, which at least for the U.S.-India relationship has been a positive, um, how do you then address, which Josh is going to address, is how do you then address these issues or these areas where they do come up uh, as connected? You asked whether India was softening the blow. <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, I think a more interesting question is whether the United States is softening the blow in the sense uh, 
of whether the United States is trying to find a way to reassure Pakistan that the, uh, the deepening of U.S.-India ties won't come at an enormous expense to Pakistan or to the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. Uh, and there it's a little bit unclear. I mean, uh, you know, Pompeo stopped very briefly in Pakistan on his way to India. Uh, there is an attempt to continue to engage. But if you take a step back and think about what the U.S. has been trying to do with Pakistan under Trump, very briefly, I mean, there's been an attempt on the one hand to uh, scale down the relationship. And I think the logic here is let's, let's think about our outlays with respect to the expected returns on that investment. We've put billions of dollars into the Pakistan relationship, and the feeling in this town is that the returns on that money have been very low. So there has been a sort of return on investment calculus under this administration to say let's scale down the money, the time, the level of diplomatic engagement to a level that is commensurate with what we're getting from this. That process in some ways started you know, when I was in the White House and has now continued uh, more dramatically under President Trump, but that is a way of looking at the bilateral relationship. The other element of the U.S. strategy has been to say let's use this reduction in engagement uh, in combination with some other levers to try to extract some changes on the part of Pakistan with the way that it deals with militant groups, the Akhani network, and others that affect Afghanistan. This part of the strategy has essentially not worked. Uh, and the question here, we're now at an inflection point as to whether the administration continues to push on a closed door and try to get Pakistan to change that aspect of its behavior. So I think the story is still out on how much reassurance we're going to give to Pakistan, but Right now, we're still in the pressure part of the strategy, and uh, so there's not a lot of reassurance. And I think, you know, over the short term, that you know that makes some sense from where the administration is is at. But over the longer term, I do think there are some risks in having a, a very uh, deep and healthy relationship with India, and having a relationship with Pakistan that is consistently fraught. I mean, there are some risks to U.S. interests that come from that. Um, Thank you for your question on the Taliban. I would say two things very briefly. The first is that I don't see the conflict in Afghanistan as being integrally and substantive related, substantively related to the India-Pakistan conflict as a core driver. I mean, sure, there are secondary uh, ways in which it affects the Afghanistan security environment. And uh, certainly part of Pakistan's malign behavior in Afghanistan is due to its anxiety about India and Indian influence. But Afghanistan has a... Uh, a full-blown organic insurgency on its hands. And if you were to solve the Kashmir problem tomorrow, uh, it would not solve Afghanistan. That said, India does have a, a deep and very interesting set of relationships with the Afghan political elites. And it has relationships across uh, ethnic lines, across regional lines. And in fact, India has the kinds of political relationships in Afghanistan that Pakistan could only dream of having. Uh, again, cross-ethnic, cross-regional, personal relationships. And I think, you know, many of us in Washington would like to see is India continue to use those relationships very constructively to encourage the fractious political environment in Kabul to, uh, to see reconciliation process as being worth pursuing and to continue to provide economic support and some very limited kinds of um, engagement with the security sector in a way that nudges this forward. I think that's realistic, that's reasonable, and it really plays to India's comparative advantage as a country that wants to use its political influence and growing profile in the region to, you know, to do something that needs to be done. Uh, just to add on that point, I, I think one concrete example of India doing that recently was engaging with Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. Yes. When many people in Kabul were still very skeptical of his role, uh, the fact that India, w the Indian ambassador was willing to meet with him was a sort of sign, a sort of blessing, of, uh, mm -hmm. if you will, that he was Absolutely. back in the fold. But I think the economic component is, uh, increase is, is very important. Uh, last year, 39% of Afghan exports went to India. And this year, quite likely, India will be the largest export destination for Afghan exports. 97% of the air freight corridor program that Afghanistan has started goes to India. Um, that will probably come down now because they're opening up routes to the European Union and to the Gulf. Uh, but uh, this, I, th I think, is just a, a, apart from the fact that India has been the fifth largest aid provider to Afghanistan since 2001. So uh, I think the economic component and the political reconciliation role, at least non-Taliban reconciliation role, uh, do, do play an important part.
Um, with that, it, uh, we were out of time. Uh, thank you all for your attention and for your questions and answers uh, and comments. Um, and please join me in uh, thanking our speakers today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.